In the second lecture on the origin of thinking, I'm going to be addressing Parmenides. Um, and I will be giving a bit of a different, I think, reading of Parmenides than the ordinary understanding of what supposedly Parmenides' uh, theory is. Parmenides presumably lived around 540 to 470 BC or 515 to 445 BC. He was a citizen of Ilia, which is today in the south of Italy. He visited many cities of the Greek realm, very likely also Athens. There are notes by Sino that indicate that. Plato also claims that Parmenides and Socrates met. In his didactic poem, as it is called now, Parmenides mentions that he visited all big cities. He was possibly the teacher of Empedocles, a philosopher from Sicily who held that everything occurs out of or because of the strife between love and hate, the composition and separation of the elements, fire, air, water and earth. What we know then about Parmenides is that he traveled. He seemed to have seen the most important parts of the Greek realm at the time. We have only some fragments of his poem, which were preserved by Simplicius, and several notes on and quotes by him from other philosophers such as Aristotle. There is also a Platonic dialogue entitled Parmenides, which is a conversation between Socrates and Parmenides. We also know the usual story, which goes something like this. Parmenides tells us of a way of truth and a way of doxa, false belief or seeming. Only the way of truth is true, the way of seeming of course is illusory. Mortals are all on the way of doxa and they believe that there is generation and decay, there is becoming and change. However, Parmenides proclaims that there is no generation and no decay, so we all must truly live in an illusory world. The only world that is true truth understood as correspondence and correctness is the world of eternal being with a capital B and mortals should accept that and leave the way of doxa. They should recognize that it is but an illusion that there is generation and movement and motion. The only thing that there is is being. This is how this proclamation that being is thinking is to be understood. I.e. as soon as one thinks we think of something therefore only being is. More to the point, I cannot think of nothing. As soon as I think, I think of something. One can already see how vastly different that is to the textbook Heraclitus who supposedly proclaimed a world of flux. So in Heraclitus everything is in motion and everything is changing all the time. And for Parmenides, nothing's changing ever. Everything's always fixed. Everything's permanent and stable and the same and there's no movement. Yet overall, Parmenides' position, of course, in that regard, then would be very weird and confusing and not at all clear or commonsensical because we can all see change, so how can he say that there is no change? And if there is only being, how can there be any differences among beings? Also, how can Parmenides account for, as if he were an accountant, for movement if there is no change in beings? And how could he even write what he writes? If there is no movement, how does he write? Again, all of this ad infinitum et absurdum, if we follow the usual ordinary textbook understanding of Parmenides that even Hegel believed. Note that toward the end of his poem, Parmenides had a lot to say about generation and procreation and the emergence of the cosmos. Thus, let me point out that Greek thinking is all about the question how things or rather beings appear to us, how they become meaningful phenomena for us. It is never to say that there is a world of truth in the heavens and a world of mere illusions down here. That's not what Parmenides wants to do. They were not that simplistic. That thinking is not that easy. It's not that simple. As Nietzsche seems to have believed, right? Again, let us try to refrain from applying modern or even neoplatonistic categories to Parmenides' thinking. We shall not look for logical mistakes or logical contradictions because this is not the way his thinking works. This thinking 
is original, I claim, in the sense that it is free, it is still free from such categories. Now let us take seriously what is sometimes neglected. Parmenides' thinking is poetic. Let us take seriously that Parmenides is carried to the heavens by heavenly horses and he is brave enough to follow through with it. And as far as he may come on that path by an unnamed goddess, but maybe that goddess isn't unnamed, maybe that name of that goddess is Aletheia, is truth, is unconcealment, is revealing. Note that Parmenides is moving. Note also that the very talk of paths indicates motion, methodos. Then he reaches what is called the gate of night and day, up in the heavens. Already we see that there must be difference. There must be some sort of unfolding. How could there be night and day if there isn't an unfolding, a differentiation? There is night and day, and they are united at the heavenly gate. And that gate is ethereal. That means that it's itself, it's of origin. And this gate is protected by another goddess. So this is no longer the goddess that takes Parmenides up there. That's Aletheia. Now the goddess that welcomes him is Dike. And that means justice. Cosmic justice, not human justice. That is to say, Dike is the goddess in charge of the equilibrium of the universe. Of which we form a part. Of which we are instantiations. Let me point out here that Greek gods are not creator gods, but they are regional gods. That is, they are in charge of certain regions of the chain of being. The goddess Dike allows Parmenides to enter the gate. It is not clear whether Dike is the goddess that will speak to him. In any event, truth is at stake at the poem, and truth in ancient Greek, as I said before, means Aletheia, which is unconcealing or revealing. Let us take seriously, then, that Parmenides is in touch with the gods. He tells us in a poem his encounter with truth, with truth that lets beings be beings. Perhaps the following fragment is the most important fragment, fragment number three. Tukar auto noein estin tekai einai. Often, this is translated as, for it is the same to recognize as much as that it is. Another possible translation is, being is the same as thinking. Einai is here often translated as being. Another possibility is more literal, for the same is thinking as well as being. Being is thinking. But what does thinking noein mean? In the ancient Greek, both are verbal and not nouns. So we're not talking about the noun being, the being, or the thinking, but we're talking it's verbal. It's active. Thinking is not a being. To the modern mind, the Dominion dictum has echoes of Descartes' I think, therefore I am, I suppose. Or, even more to the point, of Bishop Barclay's Esse S. Percipi which means to be is to being perceived. So Parmenides is literally just saying anything that is can be thought of and therefore it is. Or that being just means to be perceived and therefore nothing can be, there can't be any void, there's just a plenum. Only what is being perceived then is. However, there is a difference here between Barclay and Parmenides. With Barclay, being is dissolved into the perception of the subjective mind that receives its ideas from the mind of God, who is the omnipotent perceiver of everything and guarantees the continued existence of all that is. Barclay reduces being to being perceived. Parmenides, however, says that thinking is the same as being. And thinking is not the perception by a subjective mind. We can understand Parmenides as saying that thinking is dedicated to being and that being is dedicated to thinking. The same to auton of which Parmenides speaks is their unity, is their common ground. And we participate in that greater knowing, in that thinking. We are participants in that. 
Before we can consider the notion of being further, we need to recognize that this is not a thinking of perfect presence. Or let me put this differently. Presence is at stake here. Being is what, what to ani or ani here is to be, is presence, is to be present. However, there's something strange in another fragment where he, where Parmenides tells us something else. Another fragment of the poem tells us that the ap eonta, the absent, must be considered just as properly and thoroughly as the present, pareonta. And I'm reading from the Greek again. Loise de homos apeonta no pareonta bibaios. And this means that, uh, that, that we are, uh, that the apeonta is just as important as the present. So what happens here, I think, in the poem of Parmenides is unbeknownst to him, but this is what he's trying to articulate, is that there is, that thinking is, there is a certain presence to thinking, and, and thanks to that presence, beings light up, become meaningful, are grounded, there is an origin to them. However, at the same time, Absence must be respected, must be considered, must be held, must be, must be remembered as well. Another fragment of the poem is, is, so it's very important to see that in this fragment, Aletheia is at work, in so far that in any kind of this closer, in, in that revelation that he experiences, Parmenides, when he speaks to Dike, there is a concealment that goes before that and that remains actually intact in that revelation. This is intensified in fragment 9 where Parmenides says that night and day are the same, homu. They essentially belong together and let all pan shine and not shine alithane. Similar to Heraclitus then, Parmenides thinks that in what appears also already the withdrawal, the concealment is contained within that. One could understand this according to the standard textbook reading of Parmenides as saying that the absent really is not, right? That only being is and not being cannot be. But contrary to what the standard reading suggests, Parmenides here, however, rather says that the present can only come into focus thanks to the non-present, thanks to the absent. Consider the absent, he tells us. Being, then, is maybe the wrong word, right? So we shouldn't even think of it as being when he says eina is, is to be, it's just a verbal. But when Parmenides begins to talk about Genesis and decay, which he does towards the end of the poem, which you can read for yourself, about, and he speaks about the possibility of becoming as well, Parmenides uses a different term. He doesn't use the, the, the term eini anymore, but now he speaks of to eon which is a gerundium, uh, gerundium sorry, of Ani. This could be translated as beings, for example, have an artist being. Parmenides tells us, that, tells us that to Aeon, say beings, is neither created nor can it be destructed. The English translations, and probably beings is not the, a perfect translation either, it's just trying to get to what is actually at stake. I'm, probably just going to say to eon from now. So let's just say to eon. Now, English tr standard translations and German standard translations is the same. They often don't make a difference between a, I, and eon. It's always just translated as being with a being with a capital B. And that disrespect toward the ancient Greek is, of course, at its peak when scholars take the liberty to flatly equate a, I with eon and translate both with being with a capital B. But what is to eon? How are we to understand it? As John Bernay says, Parmenides does not say a word about being anywhere, and Bernay continues in a footnote, we must not render to eon by being, das sein or lettre. It is just what is. However, there's something else, there's something more than Bernay lets on here. German texts often have the translation das sein, but I don't think right now that this is a very good way, so I'm just going to stick with the Greek. Now, what is meant by eon? 
we need to do this because, again, it is only in terms of Eon that Parmenides talks of uncreatedness and indestructibility. To Eon is also described as whole, one unified. To Eon does not come from uh, non-beings, very important, this is usually translated as nothing. However, to Eon does not emerge from, from any, from itself. It is, it just is. It has its own inner necessity. And so it's, but what could it be? Um, the important, I think, uh, insight that we can have here is that to Eon is origin. And that doesn't mean that it's the origin in a sense, in a linear sense of time, that this is where everything begins. I think that by origin, it's, it's the anchor, it's the, the proper ground um, that Parmenides thinks of. The, it's the Ache, really. Hermann Cohen, uh, in The Logic of Pure Recognition, writes that the question for the origin is what first places the human being in a meaningful, meaningful context of being. I like the word context, but let's just say that for now. Now, I'm quoting from Cohen. Only then do beings as beings become a problem. To translate to eon as ground, however, would not be enough either, for it is not being in any way subsists, and it's not a ground that subsists other beings. But, however, it's something that allows qua origin for everything that is to be. The origin in Parmenides' thinking is to eon, but not being with a capital V. It's not a substance, I think. This is why it's to eon. To eon is what's uncreated and unmoving and unchanging. It, has no, it, it doesn't change, it doesn't age, it doesn't move. That's the one. In this uncreated origin, uncreated just as the cosmos is uncreated for Heraclitus and for Aristotle, in this uncreated origin, all things are grounded and unified. To Eon is thus fundamentally such interrelatedness without beginning and without ending, without generation and without destruction, it's self-limited, for it is a whole. It is the one and lets all be. When Parmenides says that there is nothing outside To Eon, and by the way, to let something be is very, very different from, from properly just... Uh, uh, to, that, that means to let something be is not saying that something emanates from, from it. Now, there is nothing without it. There's nothing outside of it. That's very important. But um, there was an absence before that realization. And the failure, as it were, of mortals is to disregard the origin. That's what the way of doxa, that so-called way of the mortals, is, is getting wrong. Is that we don't think the origin. Is that we are trapped in, 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 in the everyday, in, in you know, the benign questions of what we go about, rather than thinking, what is it that lets all things be? And therefore, Parmenides, I think, also tries to, to, to think the truth of the unity in difference. And rather than saying difference, I would say unfolding. There is always an unfolding, a letting unfold, and that's that's captured in Toyon. All things spring from this grounded oneness by the mixing. Right? The poem of Parmenides speaks of mixing. H how does this make any sense to speak of mixing if you don't allow for motion and change and there's no decay supposedly? The Really the problem is with so much of academic so-called philosophy is that it's just textbook philosophy. No one actually reads the original texts. No one cares what's in it. No one cares to maybe look at the original Greek for a change. No one cares to maybe criticize, but, but maybe they just go with what's the standard knowledge and then we, they start operating with that without ever questioning. Or maybe, um, how is it possible then that Parmenides tells us that he traveled all the cities? How is it possible that he tells us that he moved up to the heavens if he doesn't believe in motion? A very strange way to begin a poem that's supposedly all about denying the possibility of motion. A very strange way to do that, isn't it? And now, um, the, he, Parmenides speaks of the love between woman and man that forms the bodies of their offspring. So there is generation. I, I, I do think there is. So we see then that the claim that there is no generation 
is flat out wrong and maybe it's even something worse. Maybe it's not just wrong, maybe it's gatekeeping. Maybe there's something there that shall not be addressed. The only thing that is not created is origin, is toion. And the origin speaks to the amazement that there is something at all. And that there is something at all needs always to respect also the possibility of not being, of apeonta. So Parmenides all of a sudden looks very different from what we usually hear. Those then who continue to assert that Parmenides is all about non-movement themselves do not even attempt to think the origin properly. They are ignorant just as the mortals that Parmenides addresses are ignorant of the wholeness of the one grounding and letting all beings, letting all beings be. Parmenides nowhere says that the mortals live in but a world of illusion or even a lie. It is only that they immediately take everything to be as a single thing not connected to everything else. But what he wants to show us is that everything's radically and fundamentally belonging together to the same to autor and grounded in a grounding ground. The mortals then live in a certain groundlessness. And that threat is imminent always up until this day. And the human being is always in the responsibility to think the origin and history. Mortals are all of us at any time when we simply, we are, we become, we become irresponsible, non-responding to that question. If we simply give in to the flux, that's what Heraclitus warns us of and that's what Pimenides warns us of. But that what they both think is harmony. They try to think the harmony of the cosmos. The harmony you can think of as um, an orchestra that is obviously, um, you have tension on the strings of the violin, right, of, of the instruments, right? And when you play, and you play it properly, and there's lots of tension in your body by playing it in, in the orchestra in general, that tension can bring about a wonderful equilibrium, justice, a harmony, just about for a moment, as Hölderlin tells us in the Rhine, that it's always just with the blink of an eye that there is such an equilibrium. And what per Parmenides saw with mortals, with that kind of immediate taking in of everything that is as single things, that's exactly the story of the cave in Plato that we'll talk about in the next video lecture on the origin. Thank you very much.